has changed a lot of people's lives. But what has it been like for you since you essentially in 1995 came out with what? The Malignant Self-Love book? Yeah. I was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice. And I found myself in a, in a situation where there was no, no literature. There was academic literature, which dated to the beginning of the 20th century, believe it or not. There were some studies conducted in the 70s, but there was no literature, definitely no popular literature. I wanted to understand my disorder. I wanted to pull myself out of the, out of the rock bottom situation I found myself in. And so I started to study. And, and then the first thing I discovered is that there was no language. There was simply no language. I was trying to explain, I was trying to describe internal dynamics in myself. Mm -hmm. I was trying to um, commit to paper relationships what happened in my interpersonal relationships, intimate relationships, workplace relationships, etc. And I couldn't, there was no language, simply. So the first thing I did in, in 1995 was invent a whole new language. So the bulk of the language in use today, for example, narcissistic abuse. Right. But not, not only. Uh, was actually either, I either invented it, I either coined it, or I borrowed from early psychoanalytic literature, psychoanalytic literature in 1930s up to the 1960s. I borrowed terms and phrases from that literature and I adapted them to the study of Nazism. So today about 90% of the language in use is the language that I uh, came up with in the, in the 90s. It's a direct- I did, that, I did it first and foremost to capture my experience so, initially. So today, much is a derivative of your exploration into understanding or setting a language for what you were going through. Yeah, it started 90, like that. 90%, started. I'm gonna make sure I understand, 90% of what everyone is batting around <laughs> came about because you well, were- the language, the so, language. I mean, the language, the, the overall- yeah, the language, language, yeah. The language is easily 90%, if not more. I mean, flying monkeys, hoovering, uh, somatic narcissists, cerebral narcissists, inverted narcissists, um, narcissistic supply, false self, devalue and discard, narcissistic abuse. These are all my creations or adaptations of early, early psychoanalytic analytic literature. In 1995, you're a professional at that time, yes? Right? You're a professional. I was, a, I was actually a businessman. Oh, oh you're a businessman. Okay. All right. You're a businessman. Now, you, did you, did and, you a physicist, oh, and a physicist. And a physicist. Right. Right. That's right. You're, yeah. I'm, I'm telling you that's right. I'm just saying everything that I've been reading about you. Uh, you would consider me a stalker. <laughs> so it was, I've been studying you. I haven't got much sleep since the, the, uh, we, we've been talking. I just want to tell you this. I'm trying to wrap my brain around this much. Before that time frame, there was no one that could help you with the language. Were you seeing a therapist or anything like that at that time? Nobody could. Yeah, so give... I was diagnosed by two therapists, but you must you must realize that the first time narcissistic personality disorder yeah. had, appe had appeared in any meaningful text yeah. was 19, 1980. That's not a long time ago. No, that is not. Okay, no. you're, blowing, you're blowing my mind, Sam. Night, okay, that's so not that's, long that's ago. Not long ago. So when the first time I'd been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder was 1985. That was five years after NPD made it into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Got it. Got no it. one knew anything about NPD. Nothing. There was nothing. There was no literature, no scholarship, no nothing. It was virgin land, terra incognita. And when I when I attempted to describe to people what's going on inside me, right, and what it is that I'm doing to my so-called nearest and dearest, my insignificant others, my non-intimate partners, you know, right. I was trying to, to convey this when I was trying to communicate. I had to resort to, to phrases half a page long. And then I said, the heck with it. I mean, I must come up with a language, you know? Right. And so I did, I did come up with a language. Of course, a lot of time had passed since then. Um, the field had evolved beyond recognition. There are many dozens of new contributors and hundreds maybe of new contributors and so on. But I think, I think my initial work was pioneering and, and I think it had transformed it had transformed society in, in several ways. For example, today, 
the concept of narcissism is an organizing principle. Today, when you try to explain someone's behavior, I get you. Polit politics, yes, yeah, corporate misbehavior, yeah, uh, the law, law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, victimhood movements, or um, you know, when today narcissism serves as the principle of organization of social and individual interactions. I see it in movies. I can't go, I can't watch any movie. I can't watch any documentary without coming across the word narcissism in the first five minutes. Narcissism, narcissist, this, that. So today narcissism is, is a buzzword and a keyword. It is by far the, the hot button topic in psychology. Yes, yes. If that's the case, does it seem like the very concept of what it what it stood for when you started has been watered down, diluted, or confused? Yes, narcissism, of course, pathological narcissism is a clinical entity. In other words, it's a diagnosis in clinical psychology, abnormal psychology. Mm -hmm. And now it's been exactly as you say, it's been diluted or watered down and it become a pejorative. It became, became a, a curse word. There you it go. It became yeah. a way to demean and devalue other people you don't like. Label institutions, institutions right. you don't like. You know. Politicians, whatever it may be. Uh, yeah. It could be, it could be any structure. You can label it that way, and yeah. uh, people could run with it in many directions. But when it came to your life, it began to give you an opportunity to explain what you were putting others through. Would you say? How'd you say? Insignificant others? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's what you, I said. That's a, new, that's a new hashtag. You need to put that on one of your postings. It is, that's a hashtag. You should start. Uh, that's a whole T-shirt line that you have, merchandise line. You can start right there. The right. insignificant others. What were you doing to others? If you had a way to describe it succinctly, shrink wrap, I, I, how would you describe back then the Sam of 1995, 80, 85 to, to 95 before you? Not, nothing, nothing has changed. It's a common myth. It's a common myth that insight and learning and knowledge changes cause, tra cause transformation. It's no. not true. Okay. I know everything there is to know about narcissism. I wish to believe, and yet nothing has changed in me. I'm exactly the same as I as I had always been. And what I do to other people, especially intimate partners, but not only business partners. Okay. What I do to other people is that I objectify them. I take away their vitality. I reduce them, I reduce them to a function, an instrument, a tool, a device. I make them lose the ability to conceive of themselves as separate entities with rights, wishes, preferences, priorities, and so on. I assimilate and digest them. I body snatch and mind snatch. Do, do you find and then I take over from the inside? Okay, so do you find yourself affecting other individuals' thought patterns, desires, motivation? And if so, do you affect other people's thought patterns? Because when you walk into a room or when you begin to just talk with them? Everything I say apply to, applies to all narcissists, especially to psychopathic narcissists, but I zombify them. I take away their vitality, as I just say, said. Okay. I, I render them zombies. They go through the motions. They say the right things. But there's no sparkle in their eyes. There's no spark in their eyes anymore. There's it's no zapped. blood flow. It's zapped. It's zapped. It's not in their eyes anymore. So uh, then I ask you this, because you're educating me beyond belief. I, this is like an audience of one. So just bear with me. Um, sure. You're going to see me being giddy because... Uh, dude, I just, you're like in my Petri dish. I just want to just check you out. <laughs> I just find you fascinating. Um, sure. I'll throw a word at you and you tell me what you think. The word affection. How do you view the word affection and any, any connotations or thoughts that come with that from your perspective? I'm in, incapable of experiencing positive emotions because in, in my okay. world, okay. positive emotions are intimately linked with negative emotions and negative emotions are life-threatening or dysregulated uh, got it got so it. if i allow myself to experience anything positive the gates the gates of trauma will open will, will open wide for you and i'll drown i'll drown i'll dysregulate the gates of, the gates of trauma for you will open up so yes. therefore you have to navigate and pivot away from those 
I or have do to you... repress. I have to repress Repent. my positive emotions because if I allow myself to emote, I I will have I will have opened the gates of my early childhood trauma. Okay. And I will drown. Okay. I'll become dysregulated. Technically, I'll become borderline. Have Technically. You... Okay. And and when you when you when a person say you when a person let's say it's me let's say i'm doing that if i start to move toward being borderline what does that mean for those because a lot of beginners down this journey or dealing with narcissism listen and watch narc abuse tv network uh, what my daughters and i uh, provide for people it's a public service channel if i start moving toward borderline what does that mean what does that mean for me and the people around me there was a scholar by the name of uh, Rothschild. He said that uh, Rothschild. He said that uh, borderline personality disorder is a failed attempt to become a narcissist. It's when you fail to become a narcissist as a child that you end up being borderline. Okay. Now, what happens with a narcissist is reverse engineering. When you expose a narcissist to stress, especially a challenge to the narcissist's grandiosity, mm -hmm. humiliation, especially public humiliation. The narcissist goes through a process called narcissistic injury or narcissistic wounding. Another much, much more profound process is called narcissistic mortification. In these two processes, the defenses of the narcissist crumble, disappear. And consequently, the narcissist is exposed to an, a tsunami of negative emotionality, including shame, guilt, fear, etc. At that point, he becomes technically a borderline. So narcissistic rage, narcissistic rage is a borderline state of narcissism. At that point, he becomes a borderline in the sense that he can no longer control his emotions. They become dysregulated. They take over. He's overwhelmed. He drowns in them. And he flails around and, and he lashes out. And he, so he becomes very injurious to other people, dangerous to other people. Now, in some cases, um, a psychopathic state emerges. Right. So the, the transition is from narcissism to borderline and then to psychopathy. Now, that's not a steady pattern that will happen all the time then, but it can lead to a psychopathic aspect from the borderline. A derivative of it will they can move into that area. Or let me rephrase that. I'm going to go back to me. I could go from being borderline and then move to that psychopathic state. All borderlines, all people in a borderline state, let alone with borderline personality disorder, all of them have a psychopathic self state. Ah, okay. So it's a protective state. It's a savior state. It's a rescuer state. The psychopathic it's, state? Yes, the psychopathic state helps to defend and protect the borderline from from abandonment, from humiliation, from rejection, from fear, from shame, from guilt. So when the borderline experiences stress, when she feels that she's about to be abandoned, abandonment anxiety, right, right. when she can no longer regulate her emotions, mm -hmm. suddenly she becomes a secondary psychopath. A secondary psychopath is a psychopath with emotions and empathy. So she becomes a secondary psychopath and she begins to behave like a psychopath would. It's the same with the narcissist. When the narcissist is challenged, his grandiosity is challenged and undermined, when mm -hmm. he's devalued, when he's humiliated, exposed, when he, whatever when he's exposed, right, right. He then he then transitions to borderline, and then the borderline experiences dysregulated emotions, and the narcissist becomes a psychopath, a, sec, a, a temporary secondary, psychopath. secondary psycho, psychopath. When they get into yeah. the, excuse me, I'm back to me. So I get into a secondary psychopath state. When I'm As a narcissist, it, excuse me, just correct. As a narcissist, yeah. you're incapable of empathy and emotions. So you will transition to a primary psychopath, not secondary. Ah, uh, okay, got it. And now once once I'm in that state, mm, everybody in my uh in my sphere, everyone in my anybody that I come across, I'm gonna super duper lash out. As a psychopath, in the psychopathic self-state, yeah, you are you are defiant. You are contumacious. You hate authority. Uh, you are you are reckless. Yeah. You are impulsive. You are aggressive in the in the psychopathic you, system. You, huge emotional pushback and, and defiance will will come to the fore. Is kind of what you're saying. If defiance, I defiance aggression, correct me, correct me if I understand you. Yes, defiance aggression, um, hatred of authority and rules, 
uh, impuls impulsivity, recklessness. You will do crazy things that will endanger people around you. You know. Right, right, right. And now, is is it possible that I would de-escalate or come down from that? You do always. This is a temporary oh. substate. It's a okay. temporary substate. Having re-established your grandiosity as a narcissist, because when you become a psychopath, you terrify everyone around you. You set everything so back in order, as it were. You, yes, you you feel godlike. You, yeah, you psychopath, create... you feel godlike because everyone is terrified of you. Yeah, and oh, so yeah. your grand, your grandiosity is restored. And once your grandiosity is restored, you don't need to be a psychopath anymore. You can go back to being a narcissist. If this becomes a pattern that a person can, if, if this is a pattern that I have from childhood, and I've perfected it, I can set the world or the universe in my own mind. I'm just saying this. You're the expert. Again, an audience of one, you're enduring my my weirdness here. Okay, so then I can pretty much set the world uh, back in order if I don't think uh, everything's going my way and I'm about to get exposed to childhood trauma and emotions or whatever it may be. <clears throat> All I have to do is when I get to that psychopathic, a primary stage, if I'm understanding you correctly. Primary, primary psychopathic. So right? Okay. I can pretty much set the world back in order and I could be godlike and put everything back and now everything's okay. Because I've I've made sure everybody's afraid of me, yes. What I or what I could do to them, leave them, abandon them, take their affect their finances. You feel omnipotent. You feel omnipotent. Yeah, you feel you all go. powerful, Perfect. all powerful, and then then you don't need to be a psychopath because your grandiosity oh, no, has been restored. Right. You're a narcissist. Yeah. yeah, I can I can go back down to being a narcissist as it were. Right. This pattern of existence is not just one or two people on the planet. Have you recognized that it's an ongoing pattern that's growing? Well, we should distinguish very carefully, and this distinction is lost on many self-styled experts and so on. We should distinguish between narcissistic personality disorder, okay. mal malignant narcissism, which is a confluence of psychopathy and narcissism, mm -hmm. and narcissistic style. Now, the concept of narcissistic style was first described by Lynn Sperry. Lynn, Lynn Sperry is a scholar. Theodore Millen, another guy. I'm taking notes. Okay, so just... Lynn Sperry and Theodore Millen described the narcissistic style. Narcissistic style is simply someone who is an a-hole, you know, just an a-hole. He tramples on everyone, he's insensitive, he cracks the wrong jokes at the wrong time, he's right, right, exploitative, right. exploitative he's, a, he's a bit abusive, and so on and so forth. But he doesn't amount to a full-fledged narcissist. It is estimated that up to 15%, 1-5% of the population have narcissistic style, the figure is much higher among the young, among people under the age of 25. Really? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, just real quick before you keep going, the narcissistic style, we're not talking to somebody that's going to give a major pushback. They're just being a major jerk. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Yes. You were saying. Jerks. That's a word. Jerks. Okay. And this is much more common among the young than among the older generations. There are studies by J John Twench and Keith Campbell and many others that have demonstrated that this kind of narcissism, narcissistic style, had exploded among the young and is five times higher than 40 years ago. So it seems to be the style, the personality style, the dominant personality style of young people, possibly because of the influence of social media. Social media, know. I was going to say that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. Well, it could, we, don't could, know, we don't know which is the chicken, the which is the egg. We, yeah, but one thing is for sure, you, you're going to get you're going to get chicken in one way or the other. Either scrambled, yeah. or you're going to get it cooked, one or the other. So, so either way, social media could be feeding that. Uh, but that's, that's something. Uh, that's a whole nother show. But but so when it's a narcissistic style, and then you have narcissistic the other personality one? disorder. Okay. Narcissistic and, personality disorder is diagnosed in about one percent of the population. One percent. Okay. And there are nine diagnostic criteria, and there is an alternative model of narcissistic personality disorder in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay. It's a severe, a very severe mental health disorder. Um, Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, who was one of the leading scholars of the field, in the field, thought that narcissism is a form of psychosis, psychotic oh. disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really a very bad affliction. And then you have the combination of this with psychopathy. Okay, and before they, you... that is not that is malignant narcissism. With with all due respect, please bear with me. Uh... Yeah. When you, because I'm writing this down, when you get to this aspect of the NPD, before we get to the one you just mentioned, mm -hmm. the NPD, now the first one we said, you know, we're talking about a major jerk. 
How would you, in a few words, describe this for those who are just trying to understand and who will watch this later? How would Everything you... is more extreme. In the narcissistic style, there's a deficit in empathy. In NPD, there's no empathy. The narcissistic style would try to leverage people, to use people to obtain goals. Got it. The narcissist would trample and destroy people in the pursuit uh, of goals. Got it. Everything is simply more extreme. Got it. Um, so, the, for example, the narcissistic style would be mildly, mildly envious of other people's accomplishments and so on. The narcissist would try to destroy uh, people he envies. So we're talking envy, we're talking, envy is a dominant feature. We're, we're talking about somebody that, that does some major demolition to somebody's yes. life. They're, they're not yes. coming in and just kicking a few things around and throwing a table. They're not benign. They're, they're not, not benign. They're not benign. No, no. no. Not benign. by any means, they're not benign. They're coming no. in. Uh, driven by envy or, or, or something like that and uh, fueled with anger and other things. And they're trying to make sure you don't exist. Entitlement. Uh, entitled. Entitled. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. For example, people with narcissistic style are not entitled. People with NPD are entitled. Entitlement simply, really? means that, simply means that you think you deserve some things, special treatment to talk to the top people, whatever, without any commensurate achievements without any investment, without any effort, without any... So you believe you deserve to be uh, uh, to have a PhD without having invested a minute in studies. Yeah? Right. And everything that comes with the PhD. You want, you want the PhD. Right. And you, you want the money, you want the prestige, want the, want you want the everything. lifestyle, everything. With everything and yeah, not, but you don't want to invest in, in your studies. No, no work for it. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, yeah, well, so this is entitlement. That's entitlement. Now, now that's, and, not, that's not, that's not uh, apparent or a part of a narcissistic style though, correct? No. Okay, got it. I'm sorry, go so ahead, you were gonna say. So so these, these narcissists, this 1% of the population, and today there is a trend in academia, in universities where I teach, I teach, I, I teach yes. psychology in several universities. Mm -hmm. Colleagues of mine in, in other universities, they try to espouse the view that narcissism and psychopathy are positive evolutionary adaptations, that it's good to be a narcissist that we need narcissists in positions of power and authority, like chief executive officers, presidents okay. of the United States. All I can do is I, shake my I head. strongly oppose this ignorant view. This is enormous ignorance. This is not knowing the first thing about narcissism. I, I'm, I'm surprised by that. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin Dutton, McCobby, I can give you many names. That high functioning, high functioning narcissist, it's called. So. Wow. Productive, productive narcissists and high-functioning narcissists and productive oh, psychopaths. I don't even know what to say to that. There are whole, there's, a whole, there's a whole library of books saying that psychopaths are the best thing that has ever happened to humanity because they can make tough decisions. They, they, you know, they're great military leaders and surgeons. I mean, it's a great thing we have psychopaths. We should encourage them and egg them on. And breathe them, as it were. Yeah, in a way. So... I don't think these people know what the heck they're talking about, honestly. Because, for example, narcissists, they start off very convincingly and very charmingly. They, they co-opt everyone around them. They create cults, personality cults, and so on. But they end up badly. Everything around them goes up in flames. Adolf Hitler, Donald Trump, everything goes up in flames at the end. There's no such thing as a productive, high-functioning narcissist. It's nonsensical myth, you know, and not not backed by the by most of the literature, most. So that's apropos. Now, malignant narcissists are really, really by far the most dangerous. They are even more dangerous than psychopaths, because oh, wait, are this, is this a part of the psychopathy part that you're talking about? The malignant are they in there? Is this the whole different? Malignant narcissists are are confluence combination psychopath and narcissist in the uh, same person. Got it. Okay. They are by far the most dangerous breed. And you are talking to one right now. They're the most dangerous breed. Why is that? Because a, a proper psychopath, what we call factor one psychopath, a mm -hmm. proper psychopath, he is goal oriented. He wants money, he wants sex, he wants power. He gets what he wants. He doesn't bother with you. He's not, he's not gonna harm you. So he's very goal oriented. Yeah, he's ruthless, he's callous, he has no scruples. He is impulsive, he's defiant, he is aggressive, it's all true. But at least he's human. The psychopath is human because you want sex also, don't you? You want money, you want power. It's a human aspiration. 
It's just that on the way to his goal, he would be less yeah. scrupulous than you, less moral than you. Yeah. He's chopping down trees uh, through the forest yeah. uh, to get to where he wants to go instead of yeah. just walking through the forest and enjoying the trees. He's looking yeah. at him going like, you know what, that tree don't need to be there. It's in my way. But you're both, but you're both headed to the same destination. Driven by the same, uh, uh, as it in were, natural human impulse or desire. Urges. Except, except, yeah, except uh, not, so, not so the malignant narcissist. The malignant narcissist. Not so the narcissist when it, when it is combined with psychopath. Because right. when the narcissist is combined with psychopath, then this, this type is not driven by goals. is driven by impulses, dysregulated emotions, envy, hatred, lack of empathy. So it's like this kind of narcissist has all the tools of the psychopath, lack of morality, lack, lack of, of morality. Yeah, right, right. And leverages the psychopath to accomplish narcissistic uh, gratification. Oh. Goals and gratification, right? It's the the, the uh, everything. The horses have been let out of the pen when the when the two are combined, and yes. it's off and running. Now, now, in the process of it being off and running, they are combined. Can they mask it? And people have no idea they're like that. Can they be overly charming to the point that someone could end up thinking they can have a relationship with them, do business with them? Depends. I wouldn't generalize. People online tend to generalize and say yes. Well, I wouldn't generalize. Yeah. It depends. I think it depends on thespian skills, on skills of acting. Some of us can act well, some of us cannot act well. For example, many narcissists, they are too grandiose. They say, why would I invest any effort in acting? Who are you that I would invest an effort for you? Uh, that's no? a good one. Okay, I'm sorry. That's pretty good. I get you. No, I get why you. do I need, why do why I need do to I act? Need I don't need to act. Yeah. I mean, who the heck are you? Why would I act for you? I mean, do what I'm gonna do. And yeah, I am. Well, my sure. way, my way, or the highway. Yeah. I mean, f you, f you. Why would I act for you? you know? Yeah, I don't need to act. That's a waste of my time. Yeah, right. A they waste of my time, and, and it denigrates me. It means I'm inferior to you. It means I want something from you. It means I need something from you. If I have to manipulate my basic way of living as a as a malignant uh, psychopathic narcissist then I've wasted my time. I don't have to. I just, I just take it from you. And I'll, I am who I'll I am. Somebody else, if I have power, to go and take it from you, bring it to me. I am who I am. There it's you my way or the highway. You don't like it, F off. Yeah, right. Simple. So why would I need to act for you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm superior to you, vastly superior. Why would I need to demean mm -hmm. myself and humiliate myself and humble myself to act okay. for you? Right. To even take, <laughs> waste my energy to, to go that yeah. route. Now, is by that way, considered a psychopath? By, oh, no, go ahead. You're going to say, please. By the way, similarly, um, many, many narcissists and psychopaths do not lie. They're brutally honest. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Wait, no. Because why, why would I need to lie for you? I mean, to lie is to invest an effort. Do you deserve this effort? Do they you brag don't deserve this effort. Do they brag about the fact that they don't lie? Yeah, I do. I, I never they, lie. Why do I have to lie? I'll just... I never lie because no one deserves the effort. That I have to put into line, you know. Got it. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because you got to. I mean, I'm God. I'm God. Why would I need to lie for for the sake of ants? I mean, you're you're all ants. You're a colony. Yeah. Why would I need to? So I never lie. So these online myths that narcissists always lie, that they always act, it's expressly untrue. Some narcissists act. Some narcissists lie, and I don't think it's much different in the general population. So, but. If there is any tendency, it's the tendency to not act, to not lie, because to act and to lie is to kowtow to you, is to succumb to you, is to, is to kneel in front of you, is to render you superior. You don't deserve my lying. You don't deserve my acting. You don't deserve the time and effort it takes to act and lie, would because you're inferior to me. Would there be any moment that they feel that they may need to if someone else they may perceive has more godlike authority or power than them? Do they then? This could happen with narcissists. Narcissists have role models okay. that they idolize and idealize, Got it. but never with psychopaths and never with uh, psychopathic narcissists. All right. When it when it comes to a psychopath, just do me a huge favor, because I know somebody's going to ask me this. Your definition of a psychopath is what? First of all, it may come as a shock to many people. 
Mm -hmm. uh, psychopath is not an accepted diagnosis. Ah, it's really? Not clinical, it's clinically rejected. It's not accepted. It is espoused by a group of scholars, which are outliers and outcasts even, like Robert Hare and others, Babiak. These scholars claim that there is a very extreme form of antisocial personality disorder. Yeah. That is so extreme that it needs to be differentiated. It needs to be separated. And they call this extreme form psychopath. Got it. But, but you won't find the psychopath, for example, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's not there. The word doesn't exist. So psychopath is simply someone who is extremely antisocial in the sense that he disrespects social mores, rules, and conventions. He's defiant. He's impulsive. He abhors and rejects authority. He is impulsive. He is reckless. Above all, he is reckless. He doesn't care. Darede de daredevil. He's, he just goes. He, he acts on a whim. You know, that's one of the identifying major identifying factors that they're reckless. Yes. Uh, okay. But it's not it's not uh, a clinical term you're saying? No. Sociopath and psychopath are not clinical terms. It's thrown around. It's like no. they can make you can make a series of movies by just making sure you throw that word in there. Yeah, I know. The villain, as long as you can say the villain is that, everybody's gonna fall in love with the villain and I want to see him be crazy again. Yeah, true. And, yeah. and so it becomes a comment. It's almost thrown around, like you said earlier at the beginning. Uh, narcissism is yes. thrown around. There are two types, two types of psychopaths according to the proponents of psychopathy. The proponents of psychopathy are, are an outside group. They are not in the establishment. So according to them, there are two types of psychopaths, primary psychopath and secondary psychopath. Secondary psychopath is a primary psychopath who has emotions and empathy. Okay. That's all. That's primary it. psychopath is a secondary psychopath without emotions and empathy. So because borderline has emotions and empathy, when she becomes a psychopath, she becomes a secondary psychopath. When the narcissist becomes a psychopath, he becomes a primary psychopath because he has no emotions and no yes. empathy. No emotion. No now, access to emotion. No access right. to emotion. Okay, now, I have, listen, I'm telling you, Professor, Sam, I do my research and I have, I get into it because, but you, man, I could, uh, I'm glad you're not a woman because I might want to take you out because uh, right. I want to. <laughs> I'll, bear that, I'll bear that in mind for the next interview. <laughs> don't you, don't even start with me. So, so I want to pick your brain. So here we go. This is all, everything is from your Instagram page uh, and of course your videos. Sure, I, please I, go I, ahead. No need for I got a smash up of Good stuff. Up. I just want to get uh, a deeper understanding. Victimhood, victimized versus being a victim. Shed some light on that for those who maybe have an inclination to lean toward uh, victimhood. What do you what do you what do you mean by saying you've been victimized? Yeah. You're, not, you're not you're not a victim per se. Let's start with a few facts. Okay. There are recent recent studies that had uncovered the fact that some people have a tendency to feel to feel like victims. Even when they are not, uh, there is a new there's a new construct called TIV, interpersonal yeah. victimhood. Okay. T TIV. It was discovered by Gabay, G A B A Y, and others. Okay. There are other studies, and so it would seem there's Kaufman with the drama triangle, um, and so on and so forth. And so today we we tend to think that some people are more prone to believe themselves to be victims more prone, they have a tendency, a proclivity. And, um, and so this is fact number one. Fact number two, when victims organize and when they create victimhood movements, victimhood oriented movements, these movements tend to be hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths. Okay, this is, oh, 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 time out. That's mind blowing what you just said. Yeah. This is also established in a series of recent studies. Yeah. And can essentially get hijacked yeah. by a narcissist and that movement, right? Okay, and psychopath. Okay. The third, the third fact. These are facts. These are all established by recent recent studies, 2020, 2021. Okay. The third fact is that victims of trauma, people who have been exposed to trauma, in when they enter the post-traumatic condition, they tend to display pronounced narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors. 
Whoa. In other words, they become temporary psychopaths and narcissists. Consequently, there is a, a very dominant movement in psychology today, headed, spearheaded by Judith Herman, the woman who coined the phrase complex trauma or complex PTSD. Mm -hmm. Judith Herman suggests to eliminate the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder because she claims that it is a form of complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And she says, and many others say, and I say, and many scholars say that it's impossible to distinguish the victim of a trauma from an active borderline grandiose narcissistic psychopathic state. Whoa. So these are the three facts we can start with. Now, as to your question, what's the difference between being victimized and being a victim? Yeah. Everyone is victimized in a lifetime. I've been mugged. I've been mugged twice, actually. <laughs> My mother had abused me horribly as a child. I mean, everyone is victimized. There's no, you can't go through life unscarred. Life is the agglomeration and conglomeration of losses. You know, you okay. break up, you divorce, you're victimized. You know? So to be victimized is, is simply a synonym to being alive. To become a victim means to adopt what uh, the state of victimhood as your defining attribute, as the part of your identity to convert what had happened to you into your identity. Got it. Not to say, for example, I'm a woman who had been victimized, but to say, I'm a victim. It's like, I would ask you, who are you? So you could say, I'm a man, I'm a, I'm I have a, a podcast, I'm a, right, I'm right. a victim. Right. It becomes part of the identity, a, a defining feature of who one is, one's essence becomes a driven part of the personality and the character of the person. Yeah. They're identifying, uh, they're, they're identifying uh, their existence and not what happened to them, but they're identifying it, what, what has happened as their existence. Take a Holocaust victim. You can ask a Holocaust victim, who are you? Yeah, so that's he, would say, he would say, I'm an accountant, I'm a father, I I'm a husband. You. But some of them, some of them would say, I'm a Holocaust victim. Yeah. What kind of thing is this? Holocaust was a horrible event. And of course, survivors are entitled to be wounded and traumatized and so on. But is this who you are? It's not who you are. It's what had happened to you. So when you answer I'm a Holocaust victim, you reduce yourself, you demean yourself. You perpetuate the abuse. Because if you identify yourself as a victim, as a constant perpetual victim, you carry your, abusers, your abuser with you in your mind. Because in order to be a victim all the time, you need to have your abuser in your mind all the time. Hmm. You're just perpetuating the abuse by remaining an eternal victim. This aspect that you're, you're bringing to the fore, this is not something that a lot of people will find easy to swallow. Yes, they call it victim blaming, victim shaming, victim I don't know what. But even this, I mean, look at these phrases, victim blaming, as though they are nothing but victims. When I, sh when I tell someone, you're not a victim, you ju you've just been victimized, and you had contributions to your own victimhood, which you should study in order to avoid them in the future, to avoid the same pitfalls. So... That person doesn't say, you're shaming me as a woman, or you're shaming me as a, as a 40 year old, or you're shaming, she says, you're shaming me as a victim. That means she's only a victim. Victim shaming means that I'm shaming someone who is only a victim, nothing else. And that of course is sick, it, it's pathological. You are never one thing. You're a panoply of things. You're a kaleidoscope, you're a spectrum of things, your father, you're you're a man. You're black. You're I mean, there are many no, you're, you're looking at you're, you're many aspects that can make up yeah. who we are as a person. Yeah. And from your perspective, what you're highlighting uh, is that we don't have to pigeonhole ourselves by what someone else did to us, yeah. but we can look beyond what they did and get them out of our head, and we can create new memories, new concepts. We can structure it and move on with our life. Even though it may be challenging and difficult, I know you're understanding that, but but over overall, you're saying 
it's not a matter of victim blaming and shaming from what you're you're laying out right now. There's a bigger picture involved in which a person may not see themselves as a victim, but because of the way society often puts people in a position to only be a victim. Now, I'm just going to tell you this right now. I'm going to throw this in. Nobody's expecting me to say this, and I know you're not, but I'm just going to say this. I wasn't planning on saying it. That's a common concept and construct that you're talking about right now in many minority neighborhoods. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you, I grew up in one. And it's like, there, you know, some of the old guys sitting in the barbershop or you know, sitting on the street corner uh, watching kids go by and go like, no, you're not a victim now. Just because somebody treats you a certain way, you can, you can be whatever you want to. But when you flip that around, uh, it, can, uh, it can sound kind of funny to others that may hear it. But uh, there are a huge swath, uh, a huge group of individuals that can understand what you're saying. Uh, There's a simple maxim, simple maxim. I hope that makes sense. That was that was my street ghetto explaining uh, what was in my head that just popped in my head. But go ahead, you were saying a simple maxim: as long as you're a victim, the abuse continues. Simple. As long as you remain a victim, your abuse is continued. Only you can stop the abuse by refusing to be a victim. Well, any mis any mistreatment can either be minimized or eliminated by the way we handle and perceive what has transpired. The whole right. concept of resistance, including peaceful resistance, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, etc. The whole concept of resistance is about refusing to be a victim. Refusing to be a victim. Well, well, well people, Fighting back. people that, that have lived with you, individuals that you called earlier your insignificant, uh, whatever the case may be, Others that have come in across your path, live with you, interacted with you over time, they could either live as they see themselves as a victim or they could see themselves as com a, a common ground between you and them and live together. Um, if they continue to live with me, they're making a choice, aren't they? Yeah. I read some of the stuff you said about that. I, I find you fascinating because the minute, the minute they've made a choice, they're no longer victims. Even if I victimize them, they're no longer victims because they've made a choice. It's important to understand. Uh, victim, victims, I believe that the label victim should be applied much less liberally. I understand a child two years old victimized by his parents. That I understand, that's a victim, that's a real victim. A grown up woman who chooses to stay in a relationship with her abuser, despite the abuse, allow me to doubt her victimhood status. That becomes, that becomes an opportunity for us to do another show, if I could so convince you to do that. Anyhow, I just wanted to drop that in, 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 in front of you to, to keep in mind, because I, I truly want to dissect that, but I'm not going to throw away what's in front of me that I have to ask you about. I'm gonna say a word. The word is boundaries. Give me your perspective on that word that is often mentioned in the community of those who talk about narcissism. Boundary, a boundary is where I stop and you begin. Simple. Where I stop and you begin. I can let you enter I can let you enter, like crossing the border into a foreign country. You need a visa, you need to qualify, you need a negative PCR test recently, you need to be vaccinated, then I may let you cross in. But even then, <laughs> it will be for a limited period of time and you have to exit. That was good, that was really good. You have to exit, simple. If you refuse to exit, you're violating the law. And you, can't set up, you can't set up camp and just take over no. And take no. over the territory. Now the boundary is temporary. Always, Always temporary. temporary. Got it. You have to recognize my separateness. The problem in narcissism is that there is a there is a process in childhood. It's called separation individuation. It's when the child learns to separate from mommy and explore the world. Now, when the child separates from mommy and explores the world, the child is grandiose because you you have to be seriously grandiose as a two year old 
to abandon mummy and go into the street. You have to be seriously grandiose. So it's intimately linked with Gnosticism. Right. Separation individuation is intimately linked with Gnosticism. If the process get, gets disrupted, what remains is the Gnosticism. But the separation individuation fails. There's a fail. So you don't know how to separate. You remain a narcissist, but you don't know how to separate. So the minute you come across an intimate partner, for example, yeah. you are still a narcissist, but you want her to become part of you. You want her to become an extension. You don't know how to separate from her. You can't regard her as a separate entity. You take a snapshot of her. You internalize the snapshot. You yeah. interact with the snapshot. She ceases to exist. And if she reminds you that she does exist by being independent and autonomous, it infuriates you. You want to suppress her autonomy and independence. You want her to vanish as a separate entity because you don't do separation very well. You don't know how to do it. Well, it threatens you. you. Don't know how to do it. Never learn how to do it. You never learned that from your mother. So you were grandiose, but the grandiosity didn't have an outlet because you were not allowed to separate. Got it. You were not allowed to separate from mommy, so you don't know how to separate from your spouse. Okay, so I, gotta, so I got to ask a question. So if if that's the case, let's say it's me. I don't know how to separate. The, do I start to sense when there's a possibility? I start to perceive, oh, here comes some separation, or they're going to ask me to look at it a certain way. Do I go into a certain mode and try to cause havoc so that I don't have have to have that separation? Do I make pushback? Do I become anytime, anytime your intimate partner, for example, or your business partner, remind you that they are actually separate from you? Yeah. They're autonomous, they have their own needs, they're independent, they make decisions, they have agency, they're self efficacious. They're they, don't look at, they don't look at the things the same way I do. They may yeah, look they disagree right. with you, they criticize you, they give what you happened? advice. They give what you happened? advice. Give you advice, right, right. What happens? You, you react with panic. Got it. You react with panic. You, you don't have the tools, the basic tools to cope with such a situation. You you must assimilate them. You must digest them. You must break their spirit. I must have them agree with me and not come at me. You must have them disappear as separate entities. Of course, if they are if they are not separate entities, if you're part of you, they can never disagree with you because they're part of you. Yeah, of course not. No, because yeah, right. part of me so. Oh. What's the, it, what's the disagreement? What's the disagreement? Anytime you show me, anytime you show me independence, I will break your spirit. Wow. Any, anytime you show a sign of autonomy, I will ruin your day. I will penalize you. I will provide you with negative reinforcements. I will torture you. I bully you just to take away your separateness. So I don't want you to be separate because I don't know how to deal with separateness. It separateness. me. Okay. So separateness opens the door for what then? I don't want separateness. I don't want this person, the ch children, workmate, uh, business partner to have this separate mindset because once that happens, it says, what about me? You can abandon me. Got it. Got it. You can abandon me simply. Yeah. You could find something better. You could see something better. We're not going to have commonality. Common ground is gone because the only ground that I know is my ground. And you have to understand you need to be on my ground, not your ground. And we get along just fine. Is the is the mindset that I would be having? Not even ground. You need to be in my head. You need to be inside oh, my head. Okay. I need to internalize you. As Are you blowing you my do. mind right now, Sam? That was okay. So you need to be inside my head. You need to be inside my head. Yeah. Does that mean so I'm pretty the much? The minute you're inside my head, the minute yeah. you're inside my head. Yeah. You don't exist anymore. Bingo. The real yeah. you doesn't exist anymore because I continue to interact with the you inside my head, with the avatar, with it's called introject, with the introject or internal object. Got it. So I, I take a, I take a snapshot of Paxton, yeah. I internalize it, and yeah. I begin to interact with the snapshot because it's a controllable object which will never abandon me. Right. Not the person, the Paxton in front of you per se. That the Paxton in front of me had just vanished. Snapshot. The snapshot is what you function and deal with every time you yes. see quote unquote Paxton. And then and then Paxton, you the real you. Yeah. You disagree with me, or you go to take a leak, or I don't know what. You you show Whatever. signs of life, right? You show <laughs> signs of life. Okay, and that's that, good. You show signs. I show signs of life, and then you will do what? It threatens the snapshot. It threatens the snapshot because the snapshot is static and fully under my control, and you're not. So you become an enemy. It's called persecutory object. 
you become a bad object, an enemy, because you're threatening the snapshot by being independent and autonomous. I'm essentially ruining your life if I start to show You're threatening me, seriously. Yes. You're threatening me because you threaten to yeah. disassemble my entire internal world. Because you, you should understand this. If you destroy one snapshot, yeah. it's like a brick and wall. The whole world keeps the, come crumbling the whole, down. The whole photo gallery is shot. If I go yeah. to one, then, the, yeah. then it's going to play out in other aspects and other yeah, photos. Because either, you have. either snapshots work or they don't work. If you prove to me that your snapshot is, is not working, yeah. all the other snapshots will stop working. So Chain reaction. Chain reaction. It's very, very serious threat. Very. And wow. narcissists go to enormous length to eliminate you as a separate entity. Because you, you in other words, the snapshot doesn't work when it comes to Paxton. Then you got to get rid of me because yes. the other snapshots come under threat. Yes. It's easier to get rid of you than all the snapshots in my head. There are two ways to get rid of me. One way is to devalue you and discard you. And the other way is to destroy you. Wow. If I, if I render you a mummy, Egyptian mummy, you know, it's okay. If I kill you and mummify you, it's okay. You will never threaten the snapshot. There's a famous movie by Hitchcock, Psycho, 1960. Yeah, Psycho, yeah. Yeah, right. His mother, he mummified his mother. Got it. And every morning he puts her next to the window yeah. and puts her to bed in the evening and kisses her forehead and so on. This is a kind of mother who doesn't threaten his snapshot. So... At first, I will try to eliminate your separate existence. I'll try to break your spirit, simply put. Period, yeah. In other words, put me, put me, put me back in my corner, as it were. It doesn't work. I'll devalue you and discard you because you're too much of a threat. If it escalates, then you have to go into a whole nother level to destroy. Depends how resilient you are, how much you push back. And whether you want to go through that or just discard me and move on to something else. Oh, I, I would put every narcissist would put a considerable effort before okay. before the devaluation of the discard. The Got it. Before that. Okay. So uh, there'll be there'll be huge, huge fights and conflicts and so on. There'll be a lot of <laughs> uh, well, wait, a lot of ruining people's days just uh, to, to get to that point of saying, okay, then you know what? Then I'll just discard you. If if you if I can't put you back in yeah. into snapshot. But I need you, I need you to conform to my snapshot. I yeah. need you to conform, 100%. There okay. can be no divergence or deviation. Uh, you're doing it to me, Sam. You have no idea. You know what? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be all right the rest of this Saturday out here. I'm going to be... I'm, gonna be I'm, used, to, I'm used to doing this to people. I'm so, doing, yeah. Hey, hey, look at you smiling. You, yeah, okay. So now, uh, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a clock over here. Make sure. Uh, just bear with me. I'm going to do this real quick. No, uh, no, don't be under pressure. Go ahead. I'll give you the cue. Okay, okay here done. we go. Um, I mean, people people simply don't have patience to watch more than one hour. Yeah. Um, I hate to tell you this, all my shows are at least an hour, maybe a little bit more, but I agree with you. But oh, you're gonna, you know, your audience. Please go ahead, go ahead. No. We, we, okay, so here we go. Here we go. Uh, pr prize to price approach versus the long term commitment. I I hope you can. This is it's a posting that you have. I, I'm not gonna uh, pull it up right now, but you talk about. Uh, some view life in a short-term way, uh, a, the prize to a price, uh, and they're not willing to make a commitment. I hope that makes some sense to you. If it doesn't, we can kick. We won't kick the tires on it. Uh, does that make any sense? Uh, do you remember that posting? It, it's it's a we, rough. Time. As a society, we had removed the incentives for long-term commitment. Okay. Um, sex, mm -hmm. sex is an incentive for long-term commitment between two people. For example, the availability of regular sex is an incentive. Today, you can have regular sex without any commitment. Um, economic incentives are important in long-term commitment. Today, actually, you don't need anyone. Whether you're a woman or a man, you're totally independent economically. So there's no incentive there to team up with anyone. We have reached a situation, to cut a long story short, we have dis disincentivized intimacy and disincentivize long-term commitment. There wow. is no reason to commit. There's only there's no price, only price. If I get married, if I if I get married, I risk half my property and half my income for the rest of my life. And what am I getting in return? I'm getting sex, which anyhow I can get using Tinder. 
I'm getting, what am I getting? Honestly, what am I getting? Not much. I can have children with women without getting married, without even being committed. 40% of all children are raised in single, single mother families. I mean, we have created, and, and consequently today, the younger generations, they wow. have yeah. zero, they have zero intimacy skills, zero yeah. relationship skills. Yeah, right. And they actually are terrified of intimacy and they, they distance them. They don't want relationships. Marriage rates have collapsed. Relationships have, the rate of relationships has collapsed. Dating is down by 60% in the last 10 years, wow. dating. And the dominant, the dominant sexual practice, it's called sexual script. The dominant sexual script is hookups. Um, only, only 18, only 19%, only 19%, that's one nine percent of people under the age of 25 ever had sex in an intimate relationship. Wow. 81% of people under age 25 had sex or had only casual sex, never had any kind, any other kind of sex. No long-term commitment, no relationship, no. They don't know how to do it. No structure. They don't know how to do it. Which they don't is, have the skills. Which is an outworking of not having the skills to have. An, it's and, a use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. If you hook up all your life, if you hook up all your life, you don't know to do sex in intimate relationships. If I you have no intimacy. I found that posting in, in regards to this fascinating, what you're talking about right now. I just, I just wanted to throw that at you because uh, I wanted my audience to be able to, to hear that. They can always go to your, your Instagram page and watch your videos to get more on that. I'm going to run this by you. I'm going to throw this word at you and you tell me what you think. The, the word is addiction. I think again, like victimhood, we should make a distinction between addiction and addicted people. People who are addicted are people who are reacting pathologically to a chemical substance or to a process like falling in love. You can be addicted to falling in love. Yeah. You don't have to be addicted to coke or something. You know. Right, so right. There's chemical addiction and process addiction. Some people react in a pathological way to addictions. And so they are the addicts. Uh. But addiction is actually a healthy process. How do I know? 40% of the brain is dedicated to addictions. 40% of our brain is intended to foster, engender, encourage, buttress, create addiction. Why? Because a mother needs to get addicted to her baby. A man needs to get addicted to a woman. Addiction is the force of life. It is what binds us all together. There are dozens of hormones which are intended to create addiction. Mm -hmm. Oxytocin, for example. They are addiction hormones. Addiction is a healthy process, including, by the way, addiction to substances. For example, we can get addicted to food. So addiction by itself is healthy and normal and facilitates life and bonding and facilitates social interactions and so on. Some people are pathologized. They have, a, they have a sickness. So they react to addiction in a sick way. These are the addicts. But we, we generalize, we overgeneralize, and we said addiction is bad. Addiction is not bad. Addiction is healthy. It's good. Just when you don't know how to manage addiction, then it's bad. You can love a woman. You can love a woman and be addicted to her. That's good. That's love. But if you become a stalker, that's bad. That's a problem. That's a problem. You don't know how to manage the addiction. Simple. When it when it comes to um, this this term, or, or here, I'll throw it out to you. Triangulation. What does that mean from your perspective, and from your studies, and what you know, the facts? Triangulation is any attempt to introduce a third party, could be another person, could be an institution. Um, any attempt to introduce a third factor or a third party into a two-way relationship, into a diet, technically it's called okay. diet, into okay. a relationship, mm -hmm. in order to obtain favorable outcomes in the relationship, whether emotionally or financially or otherwise. That's triangulation. So if I have a relationship with someone, 
and I want to get a rise out of them, and I flirt with the third party, that's triangulation. If I want to obtain financial benefits from someone, and I use my accountant to kind of interfere or intervene in yeah. the couple dynamics, that's triangulation. If I use an institution, if I'm a minority, and I want to obtain favorable outcomes from the majority, mm -hmm. and I co-opt Congress or some institution, that's triangulation. All of this is triangulation, is whenever we use third party factors. Now, there was a guy called Karpman. Karpman described what he called the drama triangle. And he was the first to explain that in the drama triangle, the two original parties and the third party interchange, they change roles all the time. The victim becomes rescuer, the rescuer becomes abuser, the abuser becomes victim. He demonstrated how the three parties change roles all the time. Okay, it's not I, true. It's not fixed. Okay, that's okay, that's fascinating. It's not fixed then. Mm -mm. One person can begin to initiate the triangulation. True. Somebody else can end up coming right behind them and moving them right along and end up taking that spot that they initiated and take it further. For example, I can feel abused in my relationship. Mm. I want to make my wife jealous because she neglects me or ignores me. I start to flirt with another woman. At that stage, my wife is the abuser. I'm the victim. The third party is the rescuer. But then the dynamics change. I really fall in love with the third party or something, or I have sex with her or something. Then my wife becomes the victim. Yeah. This is what I did to her was abusing. I see what she you're becomes saying. a victim. I'm the abuser. I used to be the victim. And the third party now becomes the main, has a main role because I fell in love wow. with her. So wow. it's shifting all the time. It's shifting all the time. Okay. Cartman, uh, Cartman drama triangle. Drama triangle. Okay. Now we're really going to take a stretch here and you're going to have to. All right. This is from your, this is from your page. I just put it on here. It's part of it is in my head. I just wanted to get uh, you to talk about it. Let's see what happens. Two paths to self-destruction. Does that ring a bell? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't pull it up on my, my screen over here. Two paths. There are, there are many paths to self-destruction. I don't, I don't remember that particular post and what I had in mind, but there are many paths to self-destruction. Okay, let's talk about many paths to self-destruction. Self-destruction is any attempt to reorganize your internal landscape, your mind, or your life in a way that would produce outcomes that are less than optimal and definitely less beneficial than they are right now. So right now you have outcomes, you secure results, and then you reorganize your life or your mind, and the results that you get are much worse than the results you had before the reorganization. Right. That's a good definition of self-destruction. The self-destruction masquerades. Very often it doesn't look like self-destruction at all. For example, oh. if you persist, if you persist in a job that you hate, that's self-destructive or technically self-defeating. That's a form of self-destruction. But from the outside, people look, are going to praise you. They're going to praise going to you. Work, you're going to work every day. You're looking, looking good. You're looking good. Yeah, looking good. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you know. Chop, chop. So, but that's, that's a form of self-destruction. Um, if you're in the wrong, if you're in the wrong marriage and you don't, you don't exit, you don't do anything about it. It's a form of self-destruction. If you, if you. Uh, study something which you hate and that's a, I mean there are numerous forms of self-destruction the irony is that most of the pathways to self-destruction are socially socially commendable socially acceptable society encourages you to self-destruct consider for example social media social media is an enemy of intimacy enemy Mark's, Mark Zuckerberg makes money every time you're watching the screen. Every time you're using Facebook, he makes money because you're exposed to advertising. If you, if you pay attention to your daughters, these five minutes that you're with your daughters, they're a net loss to Facebook. Facebook doesn't want you to be with your daughters. <laughs> okay. Okay, so no, I'm just gonna I gotta for everybody to hurt if you I know you may have heard that, but everybody that uh, will see this that's a, a part of my audience will know I gotta repeat that for everybody. That was awesome what you just said. They are a net loss. We are a net loss 
Intimacy. We're talking intimacy. about Zuckerberg. We'll just say Zuckerberg right now. If we're intimacy, being intimacy, intimacy, have a family, right? If we're spending time, that's a net loss yes. for Facebook or any other social media platform. That's let, a alone, fact. let alone it's television. A fact. Let alone television. It's a no, fact. That's, that's a financial fact. No, that's a fact. That's a, that's a very, very good point. So Facebook has an incentive to encourage you to let go of your family, of your friends, of your intimacy, of your church, yeah. of your neighborhoods, of your neighbors, of your. Stick your face in front of the screen. To addict you. To addict you to the screen. So. Here's a, uh, an activity that is why widely you know, used and, and so on. No one would consider it self-destructive, but it is self-destructive in the extreme. It is camouflaged, it's disguised. It's one of the most, one of the most self-destructive activities I know. It's worse than drugs actually, in many ways. Because in drugs, if you drink alcohol, most people are social drinkers. They do it with other people. Mm -hmm. You have a social dimension somehow. You end up having sex. I mean, uh, alcohol yeah, yeah. brings people together. Uh, social media break people apart. It's even much more self-destructive than alcohol and drugs. And yet we dedicate billions and tens of billions of dollars to fighting, fighting off crack and coke and heroin and I don't know what, which is, of course, okay. But we don't, do a, we don't lift a finger when it comes to this which is far, far more pernicious than any drug ever invented. Wow. You are, you, you, defi you definitely give uh, rise to thoughts that many people will not, uh, they may not have heard before and they will not forget. Um, here we go. We're going to be ending at some point, but I've got to put this word in because too many people would, would uh, want to come after me and I don't have that problem. But they would if I don't ask you about the word gas lighting. Gas lighting is a common phrase that's used often just as much as narcissism. Your perspective on that word, was that one of the words you got started with? Is that one of the words you came up with? Yes, I did not invent the word. I did not coin it, but I borrowed it. And I was the first to, to use it in the context of narcissistic abuse, yes, in 95. Gaslighting or ambient abuse. It's uh, any attempt to convince you that something is wrong with your mind, that you misremember, that you misunderstood, that you got thing back, th things backwards, mm -hmm. that you dissociated, you just forgot, that yeah. you're amnesiac, uh, that you were drunk, that any attempt to convince you that your perception of reality is wrong. Any attempt to impair your reality testing in clinical terms. Yeah. Now, gaslighting is much more common than you would think. Studies by Dan Ariely and others have demonstrated that people frequently lie. And when they lie, they automatically gaslight other people because they want them to believe their lies. And this is all people, not only narcissists. Okay. Gaslighting seems to be a, an integral part of the repertory of human communication. Now, narcissists and psychopaths. Narcissists gaslight a lot less than psychopaths. Psychopaths tend to gaslight a lot more. Hmm. But psychopaths are goal-oriented, and they're, when they gaslight, they want to convince you to do something. They want to push you to do something. So by falsifying your reality, they cause you disorientation, and when you're disoriented, they push you to do something you wouldn't have done had your perception of reality um, prevailed. Narcissists would gaslight, would gaslight when they are in, in the throes of narcissistic injury or narcissistic mortification, but they would gaslight for usually one reason, to restore grandiosity, usually. So narcissistic gaslighting is actually a lot more rare than psychopathic gaslighting. Hmm. And as I said before, gaslighting is much more common than you know. Advertising is a form of gaslighting. That's a good one. Marketing is a form of gaslighting. Political propaganda is a form of gaslighting. Um, message, messaging, messaging, I mean, on television, on mass media, is a form of, of gaslighting. These are all forms of gaslighting. Where algorithms, algorithms in YouTube, Facebook, they're form, forms of gaslighting. That's a good one. Because, because it's the algorithm that decides for you what is reality, not you. Not you, yeah. 
And so the minute someone, the minute someone confiscates, appropriates your ability to determine what is reality, they're gaslighting you. Yes. When you search Sam Vaknin on Google, Google is gaslighting you because they choose the, the results for you. They determine your reality. They don't let you determine your reality. They determine it for you in an opaque way. It's not transparent you, because gaslighting can never be transparent. Opaqueness, opacity is very crucial in gaslighting. So gaslighting is an integral part of technology. Everything, by the way, you're using your laptop, you're being gaslit because the operating system is not transparent to you. There are numerous thousands of decisions taking place every time you open your laptop, which are not transparent to you. You don't realize these decisions are taking place. Hmm. And that's why people keep saying that computers actually have a mind of their own. They, they do <laughs> things you never told them to do, but they decide for you. Uh, what is what is autocomplete, autocorrect? Autocomplete and autocorrect are forms of gaslighting. They decide for you what you should type or what you should be looking, searching for. You know? So it's a very common phenomenon. The psychopath leverages gaslighting to obtain goals. It's the only difference. He drives you crazy so that you have diminished capacity. And when you, have, when you have diminished capacity, he then makes you do things that he wants you to do. Wow. And narcissist, narcissist does it to you, does the same to you. Because when you have diminished capacity, the narcissist can feel superior to you. He says, you see how crazy you are? You see how crazy? And then he can, he can feel superior to you. Wow. And this restores his sense of grandiosity. He, so gaslighting can be used by either one of those, psychopaths yeah. or narcissism. For the purpose to restore grandiosity, if need no. be, or narcissist. Narciss narciss narcissist is to restore grandiosity. Psychopath is for for goal orientation to obtain goals. Goal orientation. Okay. So when somebody is married to living with, dealing with, working with, grew up with, generational narcissism, whatever it may be, they're doing it to hold on to the power, per se. If I understand you correctly, please correct me. I'm just, you know, hey, you know, you're the expert there. Narcissists and psychopaths create uh, virtual rea virtual realities. Mm -hmm. They create an ambience, an environment, which is not real. It's a fantasy, mm. a shared fantasy in the case of in, the, the in their head, in their head. No, no, for you, for you. Oh, they okay. create, they, they convince you that reality is not as it is, but as they want you to see it. So, and within this reality, they impose rules, they, they, guarantee, they create outcomes, they force you to behave in specific ways. And so you gradually lose touch with reality. You, you, they become your, your reality. reality testing. Got it. When you want to know if something is real, you go to the psychopath and you ask him, tell uh, me, is it real? Or am I just imagining it, you know? They become so, they become the thermometer in the room. They are the ones telling the temperature of everything. And they will tell you what's really what's they're the thermometer and the thermostat. They're regulated. Yes. And so the thing is, this is the dynamic of a cult. This is a cult dynamic. Wow. So narcissists and psychopaths create mini, mini cults or micro cults with one or two people, three people, four people, family, family. arrangement, children, whatever it may yeah. be. Uh, parents, grandparents. Uh, what's a cult? A cult is the suspension of reality. In, yes. in a cult, you believe things that are not real because the leader told you to believe them. And whenever you want to gauge reality, you go to the leader and you say, is it real or am I just imagining it? And this is the dynamic of a narcissistic family. Okay, a narcissistic so, family. okay so they can pretty much tell you whatever they want to hold you within the cult. They can tell you that you don't love them or whatever the case, just to let you recognize, well, you did that, so that means you don't love me. Well, but the first thing they do, the first thing they do, they isolate you socially. So they're gonna tell you, your mother doesn't love you. Your father actually stole money from you. Your sister is, is, <laughs> is, just, is just taking, a hike, uh, taking a, a hike on you. I mean, don't Drive trust no your wedge. sister. Driving a wedge wherever right. they can. Don't trust your best friend. She's pretending to be a best friend, but she tried to seduce me, you know. Oh, wow. Isolate, isolate, isolate. Then you're totally isolated. You become an island. Mm -hmm. And then 
they hit. Then they create an alternative reality. And because you can't consult anyone else, you can't calibrate yourself because you don't, you're not in touch anymore with family, with friends, with neighbors, with colleagues. Many narcissists and psychopaths would sabotage your work, your workplace, because wow. they want you to be financially dependent. So wow. you end up having nobody around, no one to ask. So the narcissist and psychopaths become, becomes the northern star, the compass, yes, the only yes. uh -huh. reference. That's the it. only reference, the only emotional reference, spiritual reference, everything. They become yeah. that on purpose is what you're saying. Yes, that's intentional. The, the, the overall reason they want to do that is for what, Sam? For those control. who are beginners to un trying to understand this. Control, they want to control you. They, they want to control the intimate partner to in the case of a narcissist to prevent abandonment in the case of a psychopath to obtain goals. And that so goals, if you're, goals could be anything, whatever it is that yeah, they- If you're a rich woman, the psychopath will target you for your money. If you're, if you're a beautiful girl, they will target you for your sex, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah. That's the, the narcissist would just want to make sure that you won't abandon him. So he converts you into a snapshot and then he begins to isolate you, break your spirit and denude you of anything that made you independent. If that's the case, before we end this today, truly appreciate you doing this more sure. than you know. Thank and you. Thank of, you and of course, me. I'm glad we hit the, uh, my daughters are glad uh, you hit the record button after they left the room. But you're, you're, I think you're the only person that has actually met them. Uh, so uh, they were happy to stick their head in and say hi to you before we started. Uh, but I, I want to, I'm going to ask you this. If that's the case, that a narcissist psychopath moving in those areas can do that. How does a person regain their life before they entered that cult life? They have, to, they have to leave. Have to leave. No contact. The only effective strategy is no contact. There are many strategies for managing the relationship within the relationship. There's gray rock, there's background noise. There are many. I've invented all of them except gray rock. So I've invented seven techniques and gray rock was invented by someone else. And I invented no contact as a set of 23 strategies. And that's the only set that works. You have, you have to run for your life. The narcissist and the psycho psychopath are sucking your life away, your, your vitality. There's nothing, they will leave you as a husk. Nothing will be left of you. You have to run away. You don't feel it. It's incremental, it's pernicious. It's like slow acting poison. These toxins will be with you for years after you had left the narcissist. For years. For years. It's it's a trauma that takes years to, uh, to undo. But the sooner the better. You just have to run away. You just have to cut your losses. You just have to sacrifice everything and everyone. And just pack your things. And get the heck out of there. There's no way for you to end this profitably. There's no way for you to manage. Don't kid yourself. You can manage in the short term. You can gray rock, you can mirror, you can be background noise. That will that'll work for a week or two or three. This, the poison is acting while you think you're extricating yourself, while you think you're managing your narcissist. Mm -hmm. You just need to, to just walk away. End of story. Now, there's a set of 23 strategies called no contact. I have okay. a video available. Yeah. I invented the no contact strategies in 1995. It's not simply walking away. It's much more complex than this, wow. but you need to follow this. It's a recipe. It contains about 60 steps and you need to follow all of them from one to 60. 23 you, that's your only hope. And then you, need to, then you need to deprogram yourself because you had been in a cult. You need to deprogram yourself with the help of professionals, with the help of friends, online forums, this kind of interviews, other interviews. I mean, you need to deprogram yourself. You need to recreate your social network. You need to, to acquire new friends or reacquire old friends. You need to get back in touch with your, with your family. It's like the 12 step program. Yeah. You've been addicted and you've been hijacked and you've been co-opted and you had become a cult member and you had been administered a very potent, very strong poison, which also happens to be an addictive drug. Mm -hmm. You, there is, it, there, there's, no way, there's no way around it. There is no trying to talk oneself or keep checking with others. Should I try to do this? Should I, should I do this or do that? It gets to the point, would you say, cut the losses? You have to cut the I mean, 
every, uh, everyone is a malignant optimist. Everyone says, if I only do this, if I only do that. So, and everyone, everyone has the perfect excuse. I can't live right now because my kids are small, or I can't live right now because I can't live. I, it's my mother. I have to talk to her. You know, everyone has these perfect excuses why to stay in touch with the narcissist. But Staying in touch is deadly, is what you're deadly. saying. Deadly to the body as well. We have documented, numerous documented studies. Bad for the body. Extremely bad for the body. Long term. We have numerous long, documented studies. Long term bad for your body. Long term, long -term yeah. Enormous damage to the immune system, enormous damage to cardiovascular system. Enormous, enormous. Wow. You, you I have, have a video. I have a video about the body effects of, of trauma, of, of, this, uh, of uh, this kind of abuse. It's bad. It's really bad. Uh, the, the video that you're talking about right now uh, is on your YouTube channel? Yeah, they're all on my YouTube they're channel. They're all on YouTube channel. 23 strategies, 1 to 60 in regards to no contact steps. Yeah, and there's another one about steps. the effects on the body. And effects on the body. Seven techniques of, of what again? Seven techniques. There are eight, there are eight techniques eight. of coping with narcissists. I invented seven, and some other guy invented gray rock. And gray rock is by far the best, <laughs> by the way. Really? Okay. So if you have well, to well, you're, talking, the narcissist, you're talking about a temporary aspect. Yes. Or an, or an occasional aspect, gray yes. rock. But we're talking severing and, and stopping the addiction and the, the potent poison of cold narcissism. Turkey. Cold, cold turkey. Cold turkey. Cold turkey. Yeah. Not not easy. I mean, I know you know this. I mean, you spearheaded this in many different ways, but you know, a lot of people find that extremely difficult. But it's a reality. That is reality. What they're trying to hold on to is not reality, is what you're saying. Yeah, because their reality has been falsified. They're living oh. in a cult. The, the reality is not real. <laughs> it's a fantasy. Or it's a lie, and it's addictive. The love was never real. The relationship was never real, is what you're saying. The uh -huh. It was a complete facade, and a person bought into it. Yeah, it's called in clinical terms shared fantasy. It was first described in 1989 by Sander, not by Vaknin. So, the shared fantasy is uh, an elaborate, an elaborate virtual reality universe to which you are introduced via love, love bombing and grooming. What happens is a process called co-idealization. The narcissist idealizes you and makes you fall in love with your own idealized image. Okay, okay. They make you, you're good, Sam. You're good. You need your own TV show. So you, they make you fall in love with your own idea of love. Yes, idealized image of, of yourself. If you ask women, what did you most like about your narcissist? They would say, I liked the way he loved me. I liked the way he saw me. Many, many women would answer this. Yeah, They I wouldn't say I love the narcissist, but I no, love the no, way the narcissist I, saw me. I get you. I've heard it. I've heard it no. when I've interviewed so, people for my show. That is true. The narcissist they... idealizes you, and then he shows you this idealization, and it's irresistible because in this ideal view of you, it's you're exactly perfect. what you wanted to see. And it's exactly, yeah. wait, perfect. and it's coming back perfectly to that man or woman. And it's exactly the taste. It's the it's the perfect recipe of love because it's exactly what you've been waiting for. Well, because actually, technically, because you, told technically them, you told them the recipe per se. Technically, you're falling in love with yourself. Well, technically, yeah. with an idealized version of yourself. That's why it's so difficult to break. Big, because you're not in love with the narcissist. You're no. in love with what the narcissist can do for you. And what the narcissist can do for you is time and again show you this idealized image of you over and with over. Which with which you had fallen in love. They can show you that it is. They can pull it out at any moment. It's almost like yeah. a mirror. They can just put, oh, wait a minute. Hold it. They're get, getting too close to me. Let me pull this mirror out. See, I love you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, they'll, we'll back down. A person can back down and think, well, they really love me. And then they go back to being, well, mean and difficult. They can withhold it. We call it intermittent reinforcement, hot and cold. They can withhold this image, but you're addicted to this image. You would do anything for the drug, you know? Hot and cold, getting getting a hit, getting a hit on on what actually is you. You're getting a hit on yourself. Yes. You're getting a little shot of yourself every now and then. They give you to hold yes. you in place, and they still feel grandiose because they can manipulate you. You're yes. part of the cult. You have blown my mind, Sam. Sam, um, we better stop here. Uh, I yes. don't want to, but uh, it is important for me.
I told you, you know, you're only 18. You can relate to this as a senior citizen myself. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still I have, young. Yeah, still young. <laughs> I have to, night. You've been around since 1995, but you're still 18. No, you're what the, what's the name? Jack Benny. You're Jack Benny 39. You're just like forever 39. Uh, right, right, right. You're, you're an amazing man. Um, I wish. Thank you. You know, I'll tell I'll tell you this much. I wish my dad was around because if we would have you by our house and we'd sit on the porch and we'd be talking for hours, <laughs> we'd be picking your brain of all of this information. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do this before we go. I want to do this. Normally when I have people on my show, uh, on Instagram, these lives, um, I, I ask them certain questions before we end the show. I technically play a game with people. We're not going to do that, but I'm going to ask you these two things. 1995, you embarked on the malignant self-love the narcissism revisited everybody. You got, you, you need to get a copy of the book. Everybody get a copy of the book. Cause I said, so put the pizza down. You guys know what I say. <laughs> thanks put for, the pizza thanks down. For the price yeah. of a pizza. Come on, seriously. Um, your, your mental health and, uh, learning about no contact and go to Sam's YouTube page, make it happen. Watch it, learn, uh, go to class. I enjoyed this audience of one, just you and I, um, and doing this with others maybe listening in uh, as I stream this audio live to my page, I'm going to tell you this, please just bear with me from the age of five to 15. What was Sam like? What was young Sam like? Wait, now just in a couple of words, three words or something like that. How would you describe Sam or a sentence when you were between the ages of five and 15? Before you became Professor Sam, <laughs> or were well, you a I professor went, back then? Were you walking around like a professor back then? I, well, I, I started. I attended. I started to attend university at age nine. So you're not you're not that far off the mark. Oh, I'm not. I, I'm not I became messing. I became a junk professor at seventeen. So you're not that far off the mark. Okay, I quit. <laughs> Just I was I was a bookworm. Wow. I was. I books were my escape. My mother was torturing me physically and psychologically. And so I used to escape to the library, spend all my days and sometimes nights. Books were my, my alternative universe, my alternative world. And um, I spent all my life with books, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, just reading and reading and reading, trying to escape from essentially my mother. And that's how it was. Well into well into age seventeen when I joined the army. You joined the army at age seventeen. From the age of seventeen to present day, this this moment in time that we're sharing together. From that age of seventeen till now, so much has transpired. But if someone had to ask you, describe Sam between the ages of seventeen. So when he's sitting there taking his time and explaining things to Paxton 2021, from when you were 17 to now, this moment in time, who is that Sam? How would you describe the, the, exact, the exact opposite of the previous Sam? I became an adventurer, a businessman, a secret agent, um, a criminal, a uh, professor. I, I had con transformed my life into a movie, the kind of movie I would like to, to watch when I'm 90 years old and okay. you know, about, about to expire. So the exact opposite, the, the previous Sam was a bookworm. Yeah. And Sam afterwards was an adventurer, yeah. an adventurer in, in every possible way, wow. uh, all over the world. And to this very day, it's the same. You find yourself living a life in which people want to spend time with you so that they can learn from you, pick your brain. They can find ways to get to know you better without being too nosy or intrusive. A number of things I've heard people say, uh, we've only, my daughters and I have only been doing this since August of last year. We're coming up on a year and it is an honor to be able to talk to you. But the most pressing question that I tossed and turned over that I wanted to ask you is one that I know my father would have said, hey, ask him this question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. <laughs> I thought about not doing it, but I'm going to ask you. Do you have a nickname, Sam? Sam is my nickname. My real name is not Sam. Oh, okay. I'm listening. Shmuel. <laughs> oh, wait, whoa, what was that? Shmuel. That's the Hebrew for Samuel. Shmuel. Did I say it right? 
Shmuel. Yeah, Shmuel. Yeah, Shmuel. Okay. All right. So your nickname is Sam. Yeah. So I am kind of close to you because I use your nickname then. All right. <laughs> we're, like twins. Okay. we're like twins. <laughs> we're, okay. we're like twins. Listen, you've been a you've been an except amazing. Except for the age. Except for the age. I'm much younger. So Okay, you know, you didn't you didn't have to go back there. I was gonna let that alone, but thanks for calling yeah. me. <laughs> you're, you're the one. You're the one who introduced it. You said I'm 18. I'm gonna go get I'm my 18. discount at a restaurant for and get this <laughs> citizen line. And then you they said I'm 18. You're the one. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you're eight. Hey, you're 18 until I we're done. Then you go back to your real age. Right, right. I, I didn't problem. realize this proviso. Yeah. Hey, well, I, I think have... we I think we have to call it today because yeah, we, uh, we, go. we are going to lose most of our audience by now. We gotta go. All right. Hey, it's been fun, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, I am honored to meet you. And uh, my daughters are out there, but you know, hey, they, I'll do this. They're, they're waiting. Wait, no, no, hold on, hold on one second. We're going to do this. <laughs> Warmest regards to All right. Oh, wait, they're, they're right. coming. Wait, they're coming in. All right, they're saying bye. Hey, we'll see you later, my friend. Take care. Thank okay, you. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Bye. I'm